Good, uh, good morning again. Because uh, we are, uh, the time allocated to us is 45 minutes and we will try to, to make it uh, as soon as possible. And because we are short of time, I would like to start uh, by uh, thanking the organizers for inviting me and my dear colleagues here to the panel talking about gas, especially gas, uh, in the world. And uh, <clears throat> I will uh, start by some opening remarks, uh, and then my colleagues will uh, give also uh, their, uh, their comments. Uh, I have a very prominent uh, panel, uh, which include Madame Julie de uh, Yasser uh, Sonjou, uh, the direct, general director of France Gas Maritime. Uh, Mr. Panos Mitro, who is a, a global gas segment director in Lloyd, uh, Lloyd's uh, Register. And uh, Thierry Bros, who is uh, a gas well known uh, author and Vice President of Policy and Research for Tellurian LNG. Uh, let me start uh, by some uh, comments, uh, especially on the East Mediterranean, now that we are in Greece, and uh, Greece is, is a member in the East uh, Mediterranean Gas Forum. Uh, uh, that's why I will uh, focus maybe for five minutes on the uh, developments in the region itself. Uh, as we all know, the Ukrainian crisis have shaken the global gas industry by affecting the, the European gas market, uh, which was heavily dependent, is heavily dependent on Russian gas. Uh, I will not give uh, the shares of gas uh, dependence, dependency on, on Russian gas before the crisis, but now that the crisis is here, uh, the Europeans have to find solutions. Uh, the crisis also shows how tight is the global gas market. <clears throat> the Europeans, anyway, have been forced to implement energy conser conser conservation measures to rely largely on their own energy sources, coal, nuclear, and etc., et and to become more and more heavily dependent on a mixture of pipe gas and liquefied natural gas LNG. And in the short and medium term, Europe would consequently rely more on LNG to be imported from Qatar, maybe a little bit less in Qatar because Qatar has not enough capacity until 2026, and from Australia, Mozambique, Canada, and especially the US. What about the East Mediterranean role in fulfilling or in uh, supplying Europe with gas? By all means, this region shall play a, a role in supplying such gas to Europe. Israel is currently the front runner. A runner, a runner. Uh, Cyprus and Egypt could well play a growing role as well. The prospects for Lebanon and Syria are implicitly kept for the second half of the century. Uh, Egypt, which is now aiming to play the role of gas hub in the East Mediterranean, is hoping the result of aggressive gas exploration and gas conservation campaigns that will put it again on the list of gas exporters. Two words about Israel. <clears throat> Major gas finds offshore the country, turned the country from a fossil fuel importer to a regional and global gas exporter. Uh, according to governmental uh, plan, Israel consumption would leave at least 600 BCM billion cubic meter for export over the next three decades. Even these figures, although they are large, 
uh, are uh, could well uh, represent a third of it, of the country potential reserves, according to governmental uh, analysis. Uh, Israel is now selling minor quantities to Jordan and Egypt through uh, pipelines, uh, but it's aiming to become uh, not only a regional but a global gas supplier. Uh, with that in mind, Israel reached an agreement with Europe in June this year to supply it with gas through the two liquefaction uh, plant in Egypt, at Damiata and Itko. Uh, Israel has been considering also other uh, gas export options, including floating LNG uh, that would allow shipments to Europe and elsewhere directly from the Jewish state. Other possibilities include uh, the proposed East Mediterranean pipeline planned to be connected with the main Europe, Greece, through Cyprus and the island of Crete, or a shorter pipeline to Turkey. Uh, also, two words uh, on Cyprus before concluding. Uh, last August, the island of Cyprus announced a significant gas find, which increased the country discovery gas reserve to around 370 billion cubic meter. Uh, also, the Cyprus government believes its uh, economic exclusive economic zones holds much more than that, and could put the, the figures at around 1,700 billion cubic meter. Uh, the government of Cyprus and the international oil companies working there are uh, working uh, hard to find ways to optimize the gas discoveries there, especially taking into consideration that the local market in Cyprus is, is very, very small. Uh, then most of the uh, focus is on exporting that gas but the, the Cypriots are facing with uh, real challenges, including the Cypriot problem itself between the Republic of Cyprus and the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus, which is recognized only by Ankara, and the resulting threats by Turkey. And another challenging issue is ways to channel Cyprus uh, Cypriot gas to markets, with Nicosia agreeing lately with uh, Cairo to pipe part of the gas to Egyptian shores to be liquefied and exported through the LNG plants there. Uh, also, uh, Cyprus is considering uh, the technically challenging East Med pipeline, which is still on the table. With uh, these comments, I would like uh, to ask first Madame uh, Julie de uh, Yassar to talk a little bit or to give uh, us uh, her comments, please. Thank you. Uh, actually, it's impossible to come to Greece and not uh, talking about shipping. So my point will be uh, specifically on that field. And we can, uh, Maritime is facing a big uh, challenge about uh, energy transition. So the World Bank uh, re uh, released a report in 2021, uh, which is advocating ammonia as an exclusive fuel and disqualifying LNG and bio LNG. And, um, and France Gas Maritime in France, the private sector that has represent as a France Gas uh, cluster for maritime, which is gathering energy providers, ship owners, and uh, ports questions then uh, the, those conclusions and uh, we can say that there is no consensus about uh, what will be the future fuel or low zero carbon fuel for the future because there is so many challenges to overcome for each of these fuels um, um, all green uh, first of all uh, all green fuels requires uh, green e-fuels requires great, uh, uh, great, very massive green uh, hydrogen at scale, which means 
uh, huge massive quantities of electricity, renewable electricity. According to our calculations, uh, for the first step, it will be five times the um, electricity production of, in France. And uh, the second point is that waiting for electrofuels, no, which is not before tw um, 20, 30, uh, five or 2040 uh, is um, uh, is um, how can I say uh, is um, the, the, the status quo is continuing if we wait for the electric fuels. So our projections as uh, France Gas Maritime is that by 2030, LNG and bio LNG will remain the main solution to initiate decarbonization. And by 2050, we will have a mix of electrofuels because if you have the green hydrogen, then among them, you will have then E-LNG, E-ammoniac and E-methanol. And uh, we can say that LNG enable to enable manageable and gradual uh, transition by blending small amount of uh, small quantity of uh, bio LNG, and uh, we don't have to forget a uh, um, major benefits for air quality of uh, uh, LNG, which is uh, really overshadowed by the GHG uh, because it offsets. Uh, um, all the SOX, NOX, PM, carbon, etc. Thank you so much, uh, Julie. Maybe in the same context of maritime, I will ask our uh, uh, second speaker, Mr. Panos Mitro, to give his uh, remarks. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you for this opportunity to discuss uh, gas in maritime. Uh, first of all, I, I would like to say, yes, there's a, a great chance for LNG in maritime. L LNG is currently an established alternative fuel, if you can still call it alternative, because it's practically part of the main story. Um, the availability and the bunkering supply chain is already there. We are talking about upscaling LNG, and we should not forget that still vessels that sail on LNG, they're a very small percentage of uh, the overall global fleet. But we know that on a, on, a, on a power basis and size basis, 30% of, uh, of ships ordered today are ordered uh, to be fueled by LNG. And I, we believe that this rate will further increase because, as Julie also mentioned, um, when we're talking about tangible investment, the other fuels are not yet there. So currently, we, we, we see that there is a, a trend to increase LNG as fuel in, in the, the years to come. And some say, and I would tend to see that claim with great uh, interest, that LNG is not a transition fuel. LNG is a fuel in transition. And this is something that we need to focus on more. The only reason why we don't focus that much today is the energy crisis, because this is what we hear as well from the shipping world, not only the use of LNG as a fuel, but also the carriage of LNG. A few years ago, the talk of the town was how do we certify the footprint of the cargo? How do we have uh, a greener cargo, if possible, within the context of LNG? This whole thing, and I think much of this discussion has stopped because Currently, we just want a cargo, irrespective of how this is transported or produced, because there is an energy crisis there. But in the future, I think we will turn again, and I would like to um, address this in a more analytical manner uh, at the second round. 
In the future, we will be talking more about how we green, how we clean parcels of LNG. And I think there is great room and great opportunity in that space. Thank you so much, uh, Panos. Now we will hear Mr. T uh, Thierry Bros talking about uh, his uh, his vision on to on the gas market. Thank you. Uh, what a refreshing session we had this morning. I mean, uh, normally when I hear ministers, I'm bored to death, and uh, we had some interesting uh, remarks. And and also perhaps. Uh, should I ask if, uh, should I add, if uh, energy minister in Berlin, Brussels and Paris were as literate as the one we've heard, the, energy, the minister and the ambassador, perhaps we will solve this crisis much faster than uh, we are, what we are expecting. L let me add two things to what uh, the ambassador and the minister stated. The first one, in, in a more politically uh, incorrect wording, German business model is kaput. Uh, it relied on cheap energy. It's not there any longer. The second, as a French, is uh, I would say the market is proving by demonstration, by absurd, that nuclear and gas are needed for this energy transition. You take out French nuke, you take out Russian gas, you have a crisis. Uh, and so we need to solve this crisis. I'm, I'm not a nuke expert. I'm, I'm pro nuke. That's, that's not the, the question. Um, and so the question is, how are we going to solve the, the problem? And yes, Greece is going on its energy transition path and is blessed with a lot of uh, wind and sun. But not all countries, and the further you go north, normally the less sun you have. So the question is, what kind of need do we face in terms of gas? And, and, and just a few numbers here. So Gazprom was providing us 160 BCM of, of gas. We need to replace those. Uh, we also need, and uh, the ambassador stated it, uh, perhaps I will rephrase it a bit more clearly. I mean, we are using in Europe more coal for power generation. The equivalent of 100 BCM of gas per year. So 160 per 100. Plus, there is one more thing that I'm, 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 I'm shocked when energy and economists are not understanding this. We need spare capacity in the system. I repeat it. We need spare capacity in the system. Without spare capacity, you're creating a crisis. I mean, we know where spare capacity is in oil. Adam, you know this. It's in Saudi Arabia. We know where spare capacity used to be in gas. Russia, we don't want it, so we need to replace it. So we need someone somewhere to, to pay for this. It's not for free. It's not for free. It's for the benefit of the citizen. I think, Adam, you had a very good uh, analysis uh, on, on this, the amount of consumers' good that was provided by spare capacity in oil. And we need spare capacity in nuke. I mean, we don't have it in France any longer. We have a problem. So I think we need to go back to basics. In terms of gas, we need right now to find investment of 160 BCM of uh, Russian gas to be displaced, 100 BCM, and this is just for Europe, 100 BCM of coal uh, that we need to shut in, not, not in 2050 or whatever, I mean, sooner than rather than later, and we need spare capacity in the system. Think of it. This is more than half a trillion dollars that we need in terms of investment. We can do it in euros, it's more or less the same amount, it's a bit bigger. And right now, ministers, this one also, but ministers have only put half a trillion, only quote unquote, half a trillion to help people. We haven't invested anything else. We haven't invested in more supply. So we are going to face a longer crisis. And this is where People need to wake up. Yes, we need to uh, shield our population from those extreme high prices, but we also need to go back to reality. Reality is we need half a trillion just for Europe um, in gas or anything else. I mean, nuclear can save us, but not before 2040, to uh, produce more gas, produce more LNG. And again, I mean, you, you've mentioned a few, a few places. We are very far from what is needed. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Kiri. Uh, I will start with some questions to, uh, to uh, the panelists. Maybe uh, starting with uh, uh, LNG as shipping uh, fuel. Uh, my question is here to Julie Day and to Panos. Uh, what are really the challenges in using more LNG into shipping now? Uh, is is a is is a, a situation now where LNG is really in deficit and everybody needs LNG for its own uh, uh, consumption, and uh, we have really deficit in the market LNG deficit. Is it affecting the uh, the use of LNG in shipping itself? Uh, and uh, is there any competition in the future? Do you see any competition? competition with other uh, sources of fuel like hydrogen or something like that? Okay, okay let me go first. Juliet. So, um, first of all, the problems we have today with LNG as fuel in shipping is number one, price. <laughs> this, is, and this is practically a showstopper. Uh, everything ends there. Even even the ships that have been built to use LNG, they don't use LNG today. Today, even LNG carriers that carry LNG and usually used to use cargo as fuel, they don't use that cargo as fuel. And the reason is simple: it's it's painful, but it's simple. Gas is so expensive and so needed, we don't have the luxury to use it to propel ships right now but still the order book of ships and the new projects carry on almost unimpacted by this reality and the reason is there is a great expectation that the market will come at equilibrium by the day uh, those ships will hit the water and we're talking about 2024 2025 so there is an expectation from the owners that even if they don't run directly to LNG, it will be a few months only before they shift the vessels back to the LNG fuel market. So this is, this is I suppose, now the key issue we have. And uh, from a competition perspective, I would say something that perhaps is not that well understood. There are, of course, what we call clean fuels, zero, net zero or zero carbon fuels. They are very appealing because once you burn hydrogen, you don't care anymore. It's there, ammonia, but they come at a reasonable cost, a high cost, and many challenges in terms of use an application on board ships. With LNG, for example, uh, there is a factor there that has not been taken into account. LNG is carbon capture proof. Uh, to be more precise, uh, LNG could be favored by carbon capturing solutions because it offers a discount of 25% when it comes to carbon capturing cost it produces less carbon. So if tomorrow, and we see many applications today, carbon capturing becomes very competitive and we see CO2 scrubbers on board ships, then uh, LNG has nothing to worry about because it's there, it's cheap, it's abundant, and it can work with carbon capture zero carbon fuels, they cannot compete if carbon capture becomes efficient. So eventually it will be an end to their commercial prospect. So uh, this is almost a key, it's also a key point of competition for LNG. And I think that the, everybody will agree that uh, there will be competition in the future depending on how things will, will progress but uh, most probably we will not see the scale and maturity of market of clean fuels before the end of the next decade. So we have a long way to go until then and every molecule that we emit today counts. 
So we need to be taking action earlier than that. Yes, I just thought to add that uh, for ammonia and uh, liquefied uh, hydrogen, ammonia is, uh, is very complex to handle and, and highly toxic. Uh, liquefied uh, hydrogen is cryogenic and you need insulated tanks, etc. And so every, uh, every alternative fuels today are not suitable and there will, be, uh, there will take some uh, years to develop all of them. Um, uh, we need also a, regu um, a regulatory framework. Actually, it's not very unclear uh, uh, that how will be this uh, framework. We can monitor that when IMO uh, had uh, some regulation on sulfur in 2020, you, it increases the adoption of LNG uh, and decrease the, the sulfur oxide uh, emissions by 83 percent. So regulation is really key to increase the, the, the development of LNG. But I agree with Penus. It is uh, actually the order book is free time, uh, increasing free time. We have 80, uh, 800 ships on order and uh, two, uh, 300 ships in operation, actually. This means that in the next three years, you will have three times more LNG ships. It's 80, uh, it's uh, half of the gross tonnage uh, capacity uh, of, uh, of large, uh, large, uh, large container ships and cruise ships, especially. Thank you so much. Now I turn to Thierry. Thierry, you, you mentioned that we need to replace 160 BCM of Russian gas. Uh, good to say, but do you really believe that we can stop importing Russian gas one day completely? This is first. Second, most of the analysis uh, predict that Europe would need gas up to 2030. Okay, especially this during this, this decade. Uh, is it is this uh, uh, analysis still valid? Uh, do you think that uh, really we can, in from 2030, move to another era? So, so first question, if I rephrase it, do I believe Ursula von der Leyen or Scholz when they are saying we are getting uh, away from a fossil Russian dependency? Mm. No. Um, uh, let, let, let's see how things evolved. But I, I, again, it is the cheapest in the portfolio, and so there may be uh, sometime somewhere down the road uh, some uh, Russian gas uh, coming back. Um, that's uh, up to policymaker to uh, to uh, to decide. But again, I mean, we've started embargoes, and then we've tried to to move those embargoes around. But, but again, I think we have to think of a world where this shouldn't be there, and so therefore we have to do the investment. On, on, on the second question, on the narrative of gas, uh, I think what you've stated is absolutely right. I mean, uh, let's use this crisis to do something that the industry hasn't done for the last 10 years. I mean, we've been pricing CO2 in Europe, which is a bit of a joke, because uh, it, it has been very low for a very long time, so now it's high, but again, it's 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 uh, the little detail, the little secret of Europe. I mean, uh, everybody think everybody pays those eighty euro per ton of CO two. That's wrong. I mean, fifty percent are given for free. So it's it's in fact a monopoly situation where the Commission gives you for uh, free uh, uh, rights to pollute, and you give them back to the Commission at the end of the year. Uh, if uh, we are in a position in Europe to solve this, uh, and and again, this is what should have been done twenty years ago and everybody pays those 80 euro per ton uh, CO2, then what we stated, the carbon capture sequestration comes something that is becoming valid. I mean, w w why shouldn't we do this? And I think it's also one way to take on board new generation. Yes, there will be a, a use of geology to try to find ways to capture this CO2 and keep, and keep it in the ground. So yes, I think the industry should uh, think that the CO2 price is something that we should uh, use to do this investment. And, and, and again, I'm a, a believer more of the carbon capture sequestration than the hydrogen. 
because I'm, I'm not so sure it's going to work very easily. Thanks, Thierry. Excuse me, can I, can I add a comment on this? Yeah, because you, you, you mentioned 2030, and uh, currently we, we ask ship owners or traders or to be, among other to build really quifaction plants that will cost in 2024, for example, 40 billion USD. We ask uh, Greek and other and, and international ship owners to build ships at 250 million per ship to carry LNG. And we need to understand that, and I think in, in some occasions uh, there is a, a sphere of fiction and a sphere of reality. We need to understand that we cannot tell those people, those investors, that uh, we had uh, we were in need of you until 2030 thank you very much now we will not be using gas and i say this as a global economy because practically okay europe may be moving at a, a very aggressive pace towards zero carbon this is 100 percent correct this is this is the right way to go but there is still a huge uh, part of the global economy that will be fueled on gas. And it's not Europe where we saw the, the initial increase that led to the energy crisis. It was China, then it will be India, and those countries that, that increased their share in the global market. So I would say, and, and just adding one point, we have countries, forget investment and investors, we have countries that, uh, rely on gas as a key political and economical commodity. If we were to cut demand, those countries would be destabilized. This is, all, this is political, but it's also very important. We need to understand where the reality goes. For all this, so do we have a solution to climate alignment and at the same time dealing with all this? I think we have. The, the solution to this, this is why we insist on developing the technology and working with stakeholders as Lloyd's Register. The solution to this is a global carbon value chain that will make defossilization uh, a reality uh, and feasible at a lower pace that will not kill economies, will not kill the world. Perhaps I'll, I'll add one thing to this. Uh, first of all, again, l let's be honest. Uh, how have we solved the crisis so far? It's the market that did it. It's the traders. It's not the political people in Brussels. If anything, they can make it worse. But it's the traders that allowed LNG to be rerouted away from Asia into Europe. So we are happy to have security of supply and happy about higher prices. You can ask those policy people. But the interesting thing is, if you look on the other side, it means that those countries that were supposed to rely on gas have either to face, back, to face blackouts or to go to burn more coal. And so I think, first of all, we must recognize that we made the mistake, uh, Europe's. And secondly, I think when we look at the uh, transition and the investment pace, I agree with you. I mean, Europe may be at forefront. Again, today we will massively increase our CO2 emission. I mean, CO2 emission in Germany, uh, in some of those companies that are nationalized every single day has grown by 12% year on year. Um, but if, you, if, if we are looking at uh, in the next 10, 20 years, yes, we may move away from gas, may, but then we have all Asia. So uh, if we do this investment in LNG, then the next step will be to reroute this LNG with the liquefaction that has been there and the ships into other places and the regas uh, that uh, isn't a stranded assets because regas, we've seen this. I've, I've been, uh, I was in Brussels many years ago when people were telling regas in Europe do not operate enough. This is a stranded assets. I mean, they're operating to at more than 100% and people are desperate to get uh, extra floating regas. So I think, I mean, we, we, we have to also do, uh, I, I'm not going to be very popular here. 
I, I don't believe in models. I, I, I believe in you have a plan A and a plan B, okay? And, and, and you have to explain it a very simple way. And, and so therefore we need a plan A, which is yes, we are going into this uh, moving away from uh, in, into a cleaner world, but what if it doesn't work? And in the plan A, well, if there is those massive investment in gas, it will then be reused by Asia, which is behind us. And we need also to uh, help them because they've helped us right now. Thank you so much. Based on all this, I have a question that always came to my mind. In after, or during any gas crisis in Europe, so many politicians started talking about why not developing our shale gas. Good. What is the problem of shale gas in Europe first? And if there is really a technological breakthrough uh, uh, solving all the environmental uh, problems of producing shale gas, will we see some shale gas revolution in Europe itself? This could be also a, a uh, a kind of uh, solution for the for the, the energy crisis in Europe. Yes, I think I wrote a book back ten years ago, which was exactly in this, um, and and I've been witness on uh, the uh, UK Parliament. <sighs> Two things, I think. In, in some state, we have the geology, uh, the geology, uh, the UK could be a good place. I mean, there is this NIMBY factor in Europe that we have to take into account. So it's not going to be the same as in Texas. Um, the, in, in, in Poland, it has been tried and it didn't work. And this is why Poland went for a regas uh, plan B, that that's how it worked. Um, in, in the UK, I believe uh, you could uh, Avoid, you are going to avoid the onshore uh, in, in the UK, but you will have uh, some optionality offshore. It's going to be a bit more expensive, but again, if you uh, have to, if you decommission the platform later, it should be, it should help your business case. Um, yes, uh, th th there are elements. And, and, and again, I think it's not only about shale, it's about this dogma that we had in Europe, which has we want to do something to be profitable, rich, but we don't want to produce electricity or we don't want to produce energy. Let's be very honest. If you do not produce energy, we are not going to be rich. That, that's very simple. That, that's, I mean, we cannot think that we are going to rely only on Saudi Arabia for oil, only on Russia for gas, and only on whatever, uh, uh, I, I think it's, uh, some kind of desertic place in Africa for hydrogen. I mean, it doesn't work. And, and again, it's a question of the rent maximization. Uh, those countries will rightly ask for uh, the uh, high price for their stuff. And, 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 and I'm a chemist, so petrochemistry that we used to do in Europe is linked to, uh, to the oil, is linked to the electricity. Uh, let's be very honest. I mean, the German petrochemical system is kaput. I mean, either the Germans decide to produce energy, whatever energy they want. I mean, it can be uh, wind uh, coming from blowing politicians. I, I'm, I'm happy to have anything. Otherwise, those companies will move into the US where it is cheaper. That's, that's, that's capitalism. Thank you so much. Uh, okay, I, I still have a very uh, general question on LNG. Uh, and then I will open uh, the floor for uh, Q&A from the audience. Anybody who has any question, we are ready to, uh, to answer. Uh, my uh, last one is based on the success of using LNG uh, in, in, as bank for, for shipping. Do you think that LNG can, can in the future also compete as uh, fuel for uh, aviation, for example, or for other transport uh, means. And this could, uh, in this case, really touch the, the main niche of oil and oil uh, use. This question is for Panos and uh, my dear. For aviation, I think that is the, the hardest sector to decarbonize because of many technical issues. And I, as you know, LNG is uh, minus 160 degrees. 
and needs insulated tanks, which is heavy and technically very hard to implement in, uh, in uh, planes. So it's, uh, it's shooting for uh, for um, shipping, but for aviation, you have the sustainable um, avi aviation fuels, which are basically biofuels. Uh, but I don't think that LNG is uh, is okay for that. But we can see that they are developing projects around hydrogen. But I'm not an expert of hydrogen, so I will not make any comment about this because I don't know. Um. Yes, I for aviation. The truth is, we there there are a number of um, I would say claims, sometimes not well substantiated. One of the claims that we have heard about shipping is forget biofuel. All biofuel will go to aviation. Okay, so if they are to 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 live on biofuel, there's no need for LNG to look into that market. But I, I, I just want to stress concluding this cycle, and this doesn't apply only to LNG as fuel in shipping. It applies to the horizontal uh, LNG industry. There are, there are, I think there are great opportunities greening the existing supply chain and value chain of LNG, uh, building a new carbon value chain for carbon capturing and sequestration of CO2, which is going to be horizontal and needed anyhow. And there is also a great threat that we need to address. And this is no other than methane emissions. So it may be great when we burn methane and LNG, but it's, it's climate lethal if we have a leak of unburned methane in the atmosphere. So we started an initiative along with uh, six global players in shipping and maritime, like Shell, MSC, Carnival, C-SPAN, uh, Maran, Knudsen, and the National Physics Laboratory to practically, on two steps, identify and monitor and then abate all emissions, methane emissions that come from the maritime value chain of LNG. Uh, we need to take action. I fear that methane emissions is the only uh, key critical risk that could have a real impact on the LNG industry. I want to add something about uh, the methane emission. We agree with that in our study. We show that there is some emission and upstream and downstream and all the industry is working on it and developing new engines and so on. But uh, today the signal from the market is clear. Ship owners are adopting uh, LNG. Then, then we have ships, we have the ships, we have the infrastructure, we have the engines. Uh, but uh, for the ship owner, they need to secure green fuels. It's their main challenge. And they are seeking for uh, bio LNG actually, and there is a problem of uh, it's not a problem that, but we need to increase the production of uh, biomethane at scale, uh, also for maritime because there is a competition of use in that sector. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your uh, comments. Uh, we just uh, have a uh, few minutes left. If anybody from the audience have any questions, uh, please raise your hand. We are here for, uh, for answering any of your uh, comments, questions. Uh, one minute, just to, to get your uh, microphone, one minute.
interesting session. Uh, one of the questions that I have, I agree completely that we need spare capacities. But what do you suggest to have these spare capacities? Well, what, what, what I'm saying is, uh, if we go back to the old days, I mean, people are saying we, we, we are in this crisis because of the liberalization. I mean, if, if I go back to the basics of liberalization, uh, Thatcher and Reagan, when they started liberalization, they didn't want higher prices. I mean, a, pol a, a decent policy maker wants to be reelected normally. And so therefore they wanted to have prices going down. And so therefore they promoted investment. Uh, uh, Thatcher and Reagan uh, wanted uh, this uh, oil and gas industry to compete each against the others. And so therefore to promote uh, more investment. I mean, when I read the IEA report stating we shouldn't invest in oil and gas, when, when, when I see policymakers saying, uh, I'm going to give 5 billion uh, euros to hydrogen that isn't going to solve the crisis today, I'm saying we are not even investing in what is needed today without even thinking of spare capacity. So, so this is what I'm saying. I'm saying where uh, I used to be in charge of security of supply for the French state, uh, and, and I, I can give you a trick. Uh, like Thatcher and Reagan, I was in favor of uh, us having uh, the uh, forecast in, in our demand a bit higher and perhaps wrongly because I knew that if this was the case, then prices will go down. Adam isn't going to like this where, where he is right now. But th that's the way it works. I mean, there is a dissymmetry information uh, in, in, in the forecast. If you forecast demand too low, as we are right now doing, and you say it's the end of abundance forever, then prices will stay high. If you say, well, uh, I want my people to benefit from as much electricity as, and as much and as, as energy as possible, then there will be investors investing and they will uh, de facto invest in, in, in spec capacity. This is how you're going to create spec capacity. Other questions? Please. And thanks for, for the session. It's uh, the first session where I think uh, we are coming back to, to reality. I think, thank you to all of you. What about the Netherlands? You were talking about the spare capacity. We have a spare capacity in the Netherlands, or could you really comment on, on, on that? Thank you. I, 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 I'm not Dutch, but l l l l let me give you two, two comments. First of all, it's interesting to me that uh, the Dutch government, uh, a bit more literate in energy than the others, has uh, uh, stated to the French that the idea of capping the TTF was completely stupid. Uh, for, for two reasons. First of all, you're killing the only energy index that we have in Euro. I mean, we, we've been pushing for the euro and, and to dominate something in, uh, in energy in euro. It's the only thing we have in, in, in energy. It is the TTF in euro per megawatt hour. And so the commission wants to cap it, or the French. Um, and uh, so the Dutch are, are, are logic vis-a-vis -vis here. And I think the hidden agenda of the Dutch is if there is a huge problem, then they can provide uh, the, um, the, the extra gas at extreme high prices. So, so I, I think the problem of Groningen uh, is that it's back to the split of the rent. If you go back to uh, this very old topic that we all know in oil and gas. Uh, 1962 to 2022, quite a long time, uh, all the rent has gone to Den Haag, not to Groningen, not to the local people. All the, all the rent has been gone to Den Haag and not to a sovereign fund. So it has been spent. They don't have any money left, by the way. Uh, and so the question to uh, the locals where, where we are seeing the value of our house being reduced and nobody is helping us. And so therefore they fought on, uh, on court and they won. But again, I think we have to go back and perhaps the question about Shea, which I didn't answer, we have to go back and understand why did it work in, in the US, Shea gas? Well, if, if, if you're a ranch owner in Texas, 
uh, you get 25% of the volumes back to you. The industry pays the rest and you get 25% of the volume. If you do the same for Groningen uh, and you look at the rent maximization and you give a third, I'm, 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 I'm very Soviet in this, so you give a third instead of 25% to the local, then it means that the local may end up with a check of 10,000 euro per year. Are they going to disagree? Tax free? Maybe not. But but again, if you if you end up with zero, you, you're going to disagree. If you end up with a check, be it uh, as it's done in Texas, how it's done in Alaska, then people will be in favor of this. And I think going back to the energy transition, I think that's very important because there will be part of this of this energy that will be decentralized, and we cannot afford the NIMBY factor all over the place, because otherwise we are not going to produce anything. So some areas will have to produce energy and will need to benefit from this. And, 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 and again, you're right, Groningen is a joker, 40 BCM, this is uh, that, uh, what can solve the crisis. But I, I assume, first of all, the locals didn't start negotiation on the rent maximization and the split. And secondly, I assume the uh, Dutch government will only think of it uh, once the uh, crisis is at the maximum. Thank you so much. Maybe I can add by saying that in the gas industry, we have also cycles. And we had, we were in a cycle accelerated by a crisis, which is the Ukrainian crisis. But by all means, now with high prices, high demand, we will see maybe in the second half or the start of the second half of the century, plenty of supply of LNG and gas coming uh, uh, into the market. Uh, one example, yeah, maybe it was decided before the crisis, is Qatar. Qatar, for example, will add, is adding now so much capacity to its LNG production from 77 million tons to 126 million tons, but it will only come on stream in 2026, 2027. The US is also uh, uh, seeing a huge development in, in LNG export uh, projects. Uh, even we, we are seeing in some, some uh, uh, Gulf countries a tendency to, to move more and more for gas export. Uh, Abu Dhabi, for example, is, is really uh, putting plans to export more and more gas rather than using gas domestically. Uh, we, we can see plenty of uh, new projects in Canada, in Africa, only focusing on providing new supplies of gas. This would uh, a little bit appease the market, in, in the sec but in the second half of the century. This is what I wanted to say. Uh, if there is any uh, more question, please let me know. If not, I have to end the session now. Any more questions? <clears throat> it seems we convinced you all. And uh, with this, I would like to thank the organizers again. And let me uh, remind you that this session was co-organized by the Hellenic Association and the Global uh, Gas Center in Geneva. The Global Gas Center is a center uh, with, with 15 of the largest uh, gas uh, players around the world. And uh, uh, I am pleased to be here with my colleague. And thank you so much. I hope you find this session interesting. Thank you so much.